Dr. Rory is going to be our first speaker. She is the executive director and senior scientist at Silent Spring Institute, which was founded 20 years ago by the Massachusetts Breast Cancer Coalition. Silent Spring Institute is dedicated to understanding the links between everyday chemicals and women's health with a particular focus on breast cancer prevention. Welcome, Dr. Brody. really great to be here. I appreciate the chance to talk with you. Um, I have to figure out how to use it. So you just heard that Silent Spring Institute was founded by breast cancer activists who were concerned about high rates of breast cancer on Cape Cod in Massachusetts, but also in this generation compared with years before. And they founded Silent Spring Institute because they felt they needed their own science team to focus on prevention because although you hear a lot about breast cancer, it's almost always about treatment or screening and very rarely about how, why would we get breast cancer in the first place. Um, so, but why, why are we here at the Reproductive Health Conference when our focus is on breast cancer? Uh, and we heard the beginnings of the answer from uh, Dr. Van Berg this morning. I'm going to try to pick up from there. So she talked about how uh, chemicals in everyday products can influence hormones and hormone signaling, and that this has effects all throughout the body. And she mentioned breast cancer along with many other health effects, uh, including other kinds of hormonal cancers like prostate, ovarian, endometrial, and some of the reproductive health uh, issues of concern, particularly among African American women, like fibroids, endometriosis, uh, early puberty, um, early menopause. Uh, some of these chemicals have been linked to uh, weight gain. So there's a very wide range of effects along a continuum across the life cycle. And that's especially relevant to breast cancer because the breast is one of those organs that Laura mentioned that is not it's, is developing across the life course. And I mean, it's not always obvious for the brain, but it is obvious for the breast. Um, it's not done when you're born, and it actually reaches its full maturity at the end of the first full-term pregnancy, and then goes through changes again at menopause. And we're beginning to see that the breast is more vulnerable during these periods of development, before birth, during puberty, and, and then again during the first full-term pregnancy. Uh, uh, you heard about DES by ethyl stilbestrol as an example of a chemical that can affect um, daughters and granddaughters. And we saw another example for breast cancer this past summer in the Child Health and Development Study. It's based in Oakland. A very visionary researcher began collecting blood samples from moms who were giving birth at the Kaiser um, Hospital in Oakland in the late 1950s and through the 60s. During the time when DDT was in use as a pesticide, and uh, the babies were then enrolled in the study, and um, so now those babies are grown up and in their early 50s. And the study has now seen that those daughters have almost four times higher breast cancer risk if their moms had the highest levels of DDT when these daughters were in the womb. And among the moms, their risk of being diagnosed with breast cancer before they were 50 years old um, was also roughly five times higher if they were exposed before they were 14 years old. So this is a natural experiment that DDT came into use in the late 1940s. So some of the, some of the women were born early enough that they had reached maturity uh, before that time and some were not. So it's like uh, an unusual situation where you heard this morning that we really need to rely on animal and cell studies because it took 50 years to see these effects of DDT that was widely used throughout the US uh, and the world, um, and is still used in some parts of Africa. It's being used now for malaria control, which is, of course, you do need some strategy for, for controlling mosquito, but um, 
we need to think very carefully about whether this is a good solution. And you heard about examples of where these hormone disruptors are that can be in pesticides like atrazine in plastics, or BPA, or phthalates. They can be in laundry detergent cosmetics. You heard a little bit about fragrances, um, disinfectants, uh, and antimicrobials like triclosan, which is commonly in toothpaste, and some flame retardants. So some of the chemical names you might see on labels are uh, you might see different kinds of phthalates, although usually phthalates are not listed on the label. Parabens usually are, triclosan is. Um, so these are the kinds of chemicals that we're studying at Silent Spring because of our interest in breast cancer, but also relevant to many other kinds of health effects. We uh, began studying these in homes on Cape Cod and then moved to Richmond, California, which is a community right next to the Chevron oil refinery, which periodically looks like that place in flames. Um, and in a rural community up the coast from Richmond to try to see how people are exposed every day. We don't really, at the time, we really didn't know where these chemicals were coming from in people's bodies. The Centers for Disease Control first started measuring them in people in the early 2000s, uh, around the time that we started doing the household exposure study. And as you heard, there, we've now detected many of them in people's blood and urine and umbilical cord blood, so we know that they're in, in babies. And um, we found them also in homes. So we found, uh, of our 87 hormone disruptors, we found an average of 20 in each home. 27 different pesticides. That really blew me away. <laughs> it's like you don't really think about pesticides in your house. But over the years, uh, they accumulate, and people are using them perhaps rather casually and without thinking about it. Um, we found DDT still remains in two-thirds of these older homes. We found this in California as well. And phthalates, which are an anti-androgen, uh, were abundant in all the homes. Uh, parabens and aquaphenols, these are estrogenic, uh, also very, very abundant. We found that the uh, ruminated flame retardants in Massachusetts at levels 10 times higher than in Europe, where they are not used as much. And then in California, we found them 200 times higher. And that, be, that was, again, a very surprising. And we realized uh, that that was due to the flammability standard in California, which was requiring that furniture foam would stand in open flame for 13 seconds before it, it combusts. And uh, through our, our research, we published this, and then other researchers um, began to confirm it in other studies, and the Green Science Policy Institute took this to policymakers along with other allies, and the California Flammability Standard was changed last January so that you can now buy uh, furniture that does not contain these chemicals. So there can be happy stories that come out of these very scary uh, research findings, and it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful example that if, when we Gain this knowledge and share it and act on it, uh, we can see, see change. Um, 15 of the chemicals we detected at levels over a health guideline, although for most of the chemicals there is no health guideline. Actually, 100 of 120 homes had at least one chemical above a guideline. I was interested in the uh, results from the salons that were presented this morning. That was a wonderful presentation and great great little piece of work. Um, but it's not just hair salons that have uh, violations of our air quality standards. Uh, many, many of our homes, probably my home, also have uh, violations, even though we don't have standards for all the chemicals. Most of these violations were, po were for polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, PAHs. So uh, these are products of combustion. They're in air pollution, auto exhaust and uh, produced by cooking or, or um, if you heat your home with wood. So these are very common pollutants that we need to worry about ventilation and reduce the use of source, reduce the sources. 
So after we found all these chemicals in houses, we did begin trying to figure out which were the which were the products that were the major sources and because not everything was listed on the label, we, we were trying to design an intervention study. You heard about our intervention uh, with fresh food, where we found that if you switch to fresh food, you could reduce the level of uh, BPA and also DEHP, one of the phthalates, by more than half in three days. But when we thought about, okay, what do you want to switch out your cleaners and your cosmetics and everything, we couldn't figure out how to get a product that didn't have our target compounds. So we sent a bunch of products to the lab, including both mainstream products and green, healthier products, um, to test them. We found that many target chemicals, all the mainstream uh, composite samples had some of our target chemicals, and many of the healthy green products did too. Uh, which was quite disappointing. And you heard about a smartphone app this morning uh, by EWG that rates, rates products. They actually use the labeled ingredients to rate the products. That's the only information they have access to. And we were really disappointed to see that um, the sunscreen in our test that had the highest number of hits was one that they had rated uh, very favorably. So that shows you that the, the, the limits of using the labels to figure out what to use. Um, and I'm going to keep moving quickly, so we'll have some time for the discussion. We have some resources on our website that I hope you'll find useful uh, about how to uh, reduce exposures. Uh, our, our, our main take-home message is uh, use plant-based ingredients and, and simpler products. Uh, and we also have some tips specifically directed at moms and moms-to-be who uh, uh, are at a time when their exposures are, are affecting their babies. It's not a great time to remodel. Uh, if, you, if you feel you need to be sure the windows are open at all times or perhaps like move to your move to your sister's house or something something like that. Make, make a different plan. Being pregnant and remodeling at the same time are not, not a great strategy. Um, I do want to mention that many of the exposures are um, more difficult to avoid in some communities. You saw that picture of the refinery right next to the houses. Uh, and so different communities have different access to making choices about their own exposures. And that's something that we all need to take responsibility for and um, create a future where, where that's not, not as true. And that's the reason for this hat is to remind all of us that we are wearing many hats all the time. We are moms, we are workers, we are voters, we are teachers. And uh, so I hope that whatever you've learned today, you'll take that out into the rest of your life and make it part of your participation in our democracy and uh, support state and local initiatives. Uh, uh, we have a couple of organizations here. We have RSP, of course, but um, other advocacy organizations have some campaigns going on right now that you can participate in. Uh, Clean Water Action is one. and. Uh, so go to their website and, and start becoming active. And if you are on the parent-teacher organization, you can ask your school to limit use of pesticides there and change their cleaning practices and tell your, your family and neighbors something that you've learned. I also want to just mention quickly that Silent Spring Institute is fundamentally a research organization. And we are trying to solve a problem that when you get rid of BPA, you get BPS or BPF. <laughs> and um, develop some rapid, inexpensive ways of screening thousands of chemicals in the lab so that you can figure out which ones are safe. And uh, this is a really important initiative. We have a long way to go, but the Environmental Protection Agency is starting to assemble these tests so that we can screen chemicals rapidly and figure out what they do biologically before we put them into products. And we're really happy to be a part of that and to be uh, advancing this science specifically with respect to what's healthy for the breast. 
And um, I want to come back to the discussion of the smartphone apps because you are going to meet a brand new app um, that was designed by Dr. Jessica Helm at Silent Spring Institute. Uh, wait, wait, <laughs> this is just been accepted in, that, in that app, the iPhone App Store and it's on Google Play. And I'll talk for a little while longer so you can download it while I'm talking instead of while somebody else is talking. <laughs> um, but this, this new app is intended to give quick tips. Um, so you can do a tip a day, or you can be sitting at the bus stop and do five tips, or whatever you like. And uh, it's different than the ones you've heard about before because it's not about what to buy. It's not about like buy this product versus that product. It's uh, intended more to be what to do. And sometimes the answer is maybe I don't need that product. And uh, so I hope that you will find it useful and share it, share it with others. Um, it also does link out to some other apps. You can scan products with it and uh, get advice about those products. And it does link out to some of the apps that were mentioned this morning. The EWG and uh, Think Dirty apps are label-based. And you can buy things. You can buy things on them, which you cannot buy things on Detox Me. Um, but if you're looking for the, the bigger picture. Uh, I hope Detox Me will be for you. We now welcome Elizabeth Hooper. She is Managing Assistant Professor of American Studies at Brown University, where she teaches courses on environmental health and justice in Native communities, indigenous food movements, Native American museum curation, and community engaged research. Welcome. Great, hello. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about this idea of environmental reproductive justice, especially um, as it's kind of being brought up in Native communities. So we think about what is reproductive justice and what have organizations like Sister Song put forth as part of this important definition. And it's essentially, to sum it up quickly, the right to have children, to not have children, and to parent the children we have in safe and healthy environments. It's based on the human right to make decisions about one's life and the obligation of government and society to ensure that conditions are suitable for implementing one's decisions. And some of those conditions um, involve having a clean enough environment to make this possible. So in Indian country, the idea of reproductive justice has especially come up around forced sterilization. So in 1975 alone, there were 25,000 Indian women who were sterilized without having a full understanding of what the process was that they were being put through. Um, Dr. Kanayuri of the Choctaw physician brought this to light. And the Government Accounting Office found that the Indian Health Service procedures lacked informed consent, there were problems with forms, there were questionable reasons for sterilizations. And so when you think about reproductive justice in Indian communities, this is often what has come up in the past. Now we have environmental issues to sort of add to some of these social justice problems. And so if we think about what is environmental justice, the US EPA defines it as the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income, with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. And this is a photo of a playground in Houston. So clearly some communities have their playgrounds next to refineries and others don't. Um, in Indian country, some of the environmental justice issues involve the mitigation of contaminated sites, which is significantly behind in American Indian communities than in other communities. Um, Native communities are impacted by industry, mining, and military bases. So this is a photo of Annie Aloha on St. Lawrence Island in the Yupik community there with the military left behind a great deal of waste and just left after the, they were no longer worried about the Russians. And then also subsistence and spiritual activities put Native people closer to the environment, which then can mean greater levels of exposure as opposed to communities where you're not having this close level of interaction with the environment. So if we think about bringing those two concepts together, and this came about as part of a workshop led by uh, Mohawk midwife Veggie Cook 
in hot springs a few years ago that brought together people from Native communities who were dealing with issues of environmental contamination with some environmental health scientists who were thinking about these issues. And we came up with this idea of environmental reproductive justice. So the importance of ensuring that a community's reproductive capabilities are not inhibited by environmental contamination, like some of the, the issues that people have spoken about today. Then also thinking about the impact of environmental contamination on the reproduction of knowledge and culturally informed tribal citizens. So if you have to distance yourself from the environment to protect your health, and you have to raise your kids like middle class white kids, then you're not reproducing tribal informed citizens. Um, so thinking about the reproduction of knowledge as well as the ability to physically reproduce. So in Mohawk culture, you know, the, the creation story everything starts with women's bodies. It's you know, very important. So it, you know, a two-second version of the creation story is that a pregnant woman falls from the sky world and lands on a turtle and then kind of gives birth to everybody. From there, um, when her daughter dies in childbirth, from her grave springs all of the important foods in Haudenosaunee culture. So corn from her breasts, squash from her belly button, this is why squash vines are like umbilical cords, beans come out her fingers, and this is why green beans look like fingers, and potatoes, um, which you're thinking, oh, potatoes come from the Andes. Jerusalem artichokes are indigenous to this area. They're potato-like. Um, those come out her feet. If you ever walked around in the garden and looked at the bottom of your feet, they look a lot like potatoes. That's why. The strawberries came out her heart. It was one of the seeds she brought down from the sky world. And so this idea of food coming from women's bodies, it's very important that your food is clean, that women's bodies are clean for part of the reproducing of the next generation, both physically and culturally. In Akwazasne, which is um, the, the community that I've done the most work with, it's on the New York-Canadian border. So the, the portion in yellow here that you see New York State considers part of its jurisdiction. The part in pink, Quebec, considers part of its jurisdiction. And the part in purple, um, Ontario, considers part of its jurisdiction. So it's a complicated place geopolitically. Those three or four red dots, if you count the one on the Canadian side, um, but if you stick to the New York side, we have General Motors, which is a federal Superfund site, and then Alcoa and Reynolds, which are two New York State Superfund sites. All upstream, upgrading, upwind from Akwazosne. So here's a view when the factory was still up. This is me standing on my friend Gina's front porch. So you can see the factories are very present in the community. Reynolds Metals in the 70s was releasing a lot of fluoride. General Motors was found to be leaching PCBs into the river. So you can see from that map up top there. Um, oh, that was unintentional. Where it says up was us nation, you can see it's very close to General Motors. So 1983, when they discovered that all of these PCBs were leaching into the river, Gunji Cook, the midwife that I mentioned previously, brought New York State conserv environmental conservation folks up to test the fish out of the river because PCBs are lipophilic. And what they found was that, yes, the PCBs were making their way into the fish. So then her, her main concern as a midwife was, is it impacting breast milk? And to sum up you know, a lot, many years of research, Yes, it was impacting breast milk. As you can see from this political cartoon, they polluted the rivers and they polluted the lakes, and now she's got caution on her breasts. So here is a photo of Gaji. So when uh, Maria Christina earlier asked us to think about you know, who inspires you, so Phil Brown was on my dissertation committee, and Gaji Cook was one of the other people who really inspired me to want to pursue this kind of work. So she's a firecracker of a human being who's worked as a midwife, who's worked and trying to change policy around um, in the environment and what kind of chemicals are allowed. She started this Mother's Milk project, which partnered with SUNY Albany to bring scientists up to test breast milk and then to continue with other health studies, um, in addition to a number of other projects that she's worked on there that I can tell you more about if you're interested. But essentially, uh, SUNY Albany partnered with the Akwazasne Task Force on the Environment. They formed the first environment research project, and women from the community went around collecting samples from Akwazasne community members to determine what some of the health impacts were from having been exposed to PCBs since General Motors was built in the late 1950s. And what they found was that higher levels of PCBs, um, people were more likely to have diabetes, heart disease, decreased thyroid function, especially in teenagers and postmenopausal women. The men had lower testosterone. Um, the girls that had higher levels of PCBs had their first period earlier than those who didn't. 
Uh, it impacted memory and cognitive abilities. And then the most recent research, they found that women with higher levels of PCBs, their ability to have a normal ovulatory cycle was impacted by that. And so then the concern becomes around, you know, see a number of these factors will impact people's ability to be able to have children. So a real quick wrap up of the, the site cleanup process. The river was dredged, um, the inactive lagoons where all these PCB laden wastes have been sort of sitting were excavated, a lot of stuff was taken off site. Um, 2009, General Motors plant closed. They received a $49.5 billion bailout from the federal government and then went bankrupt anyway and emerged free of responsibility for all of the toxic sites in 13 different states. Um, so now they're the new GM, and so they're not responsible for all the messes made by the old GM. <laughs> so Racer Trust is an environmental um, trust that's trying to renovate many of these sites. The plant is bulldozed, and now this is sort of what's left, is this flat area. That great big 11-acre industrial landfill will be there forever, and people are not happy about that because they don't trust the US federal government or anybody else to keep an eye on this for the next seven generations to not continue to contaminate the community. The problem is the way that the US federal government tends to imagine these things is through risk avoidance strategies. So we ask the risk bearers to do the avoiding. Um, so you community members, if you don't eat fish, if you just stay away from this site, maybe you can prevent getting PCBs in your body as opposed to risk reduction strategies, meaning maybe you should remove that landfill full of PCBs from this area where it will continue to contaminate people. In the meanwhile, um, so there are some things that the community can't fix, but then there are other areas that they're working on sort of within their own social and health programs to think about how can they support women in their desire to want to have healthy families. So one of the things that got you started was the Centering Pregnancy Program. Um, so rather than having women go to the doctor, as you often do, you find out you're pregnant, you go have your 15 minute appointment every couple of weeks or so, and you have this certain power dynamic often between the patient and the doctor. And they may take you know, vital statistics from you, you may or may not know what those numbers are, you may or may not get to ask them the types of questions that you're interested in knowing, especially if it's your first pregnancy. So they started this program at the clinic where women who are all sort of in the same gestational time will gather together and they take their own statistics and they keep their own charts and they're able to talk to each other. And so that if it's your first pregnancy and your third pregnancy, you can give me some tips to not be so stressed out about things. Or if I show up with a black eye smelling like I've been smoking cigarettes, then you might say, well, tell us what's going on here. What can, how can we help you sort through some of the things in your life that may not be beneficial to a healthy pregnancy? So this is one of the programs that they're doing there to kind of help women. Um, also, the slides that you've been seeing kind of scrolling through all day is part of the Opaloga Rites of Passage, which one of the clan mothers in the community, so there she is in the red dress. Um, so it's a social kind of ceremonial program for adolescents as a way of trying to reproduce these culturally informed tribal citizens. They come together as in age cohorts, and it's a seven-year program, and each year it culminates in a ceremony where they fast for one through four days, depending on which um, year that they're in. And part of what you know, made her want to start this was you know, concerns about the cultural knowledge that's not being transferred or passed along, especially people who are worried about interacting with the environment, but also you know, things like teen pregnancy. So getting you know, these girls to think about the importance of their fertility and their bodies and how to manage that on their own terms. Um, so this, is, this was the, the past year's cohort, so there's 89 kids there, and there's boys too, because boys are also part of reproduction, and if you're going to have healthy families, you need healthy men as well. And so um, this slide back here, you see there's a, a garden in the shape of a woman that represents that other image I showed you of Sky Woman spotting the food that comes out of it. And so the boys, it's their job to form that woman-shaped garden, and Louise talks to them about what is the appropriate way to, to touch women, to, to handle women, and have that gentle interaction, and then the women plant the seeds in there, and you know they talk about the importance of fertility, and taking care of these seeds like they're babies. So it's a way of getting kids to think you know, literally about their fertility, but also, again, the reproduction of this cultural knowledge. So, thank you. I know I've been through many, many things there, so. Thank you.
our next speaker is Deborah Brown, and she is presently on a detail as the special assistant to EPA New England's Director of Civil Rights and Urban Affairs. Prior to her detail, she managed the region's Resource Conservation Recovery Act, an Emergency Planning Community Right to Know Act, Clean Air Act, Tribal and Federal Facility Enforcement and Compliance Program. She has served in numerous capacities during her 24-year tenure at the EPA. Welcome, Deborah Brown. Thank you. Clearly, I've been around a lot in terms of EPA. Uh, I actually don't have a PowerPoint presentation because I thought, well, I'm basically going to talk about the law. <laughs> Not really the most exciting picture, if you know what I mean. <laughs> but I started out my research and I was looking primarily at uh, personal care problems. I was like, okay. Kind of got the gist of them. And I was like, all right, move back to where you have some semblance of an understanding of this law. And where I ended up going was right back where I started. And that was thinking about citizen scientists. And does everybody here know what a citizen scientist is? Everybody know? All right, well, I'm going to read you the quick definition. Uh, uh, citizen science typically refers to research collaborations between scientists and volunteers, particularly but not exclusively, to expand opportunities for scientific data collection and to provide access to scientific information for community members. It's like torture. Sure. Is that better? Yeah. All right. Did, did everybody hear the definition? All right. And I can speak up too. Uh, we've heard the definition, and, and, I, and I talk about this in the context of environmental justice, which is where I, this, despite sort of that long-winded presentation about my background. Pretty much since I came to EPA, bless you. I, you know, I was working on environmental justice issues. My first job, and I always tell young people this, I was working with the Texas Department of Agriculture, and they forced me to become the pesticide attorney for the state of Texas. And I was kicking and screaming and I wanted to do any stick and environmental work. I wanted to do agricultural industrial bonds. That's what I wanted to do when I got out of law And my boss said, you will do the environmental work. And one of the first cases I had was a 13, 14-year-old boy who had been exposed to uh, a fungicide. And he was working in a field uh, with uh, grapes that were that would be used for wine, and uh, put his hand in his eye, and his eye literally shriveled up and fell out. Oh. Well, you know, I don't make a convert out of anybody. <laughs> and, and the kind of cases I saw didn't get any better. I mean, it was just like one experience like that after another. And these were people that had no voice. And when you talk about people being able to complain, well, in those days, if you complained, not only did you lose your job, but you would run out of the country. And so it wasn't just you, but it was your entire family that was impacted. And so the lawyer in me, when I learned the lawyer, with citizens, it was showing up in a motel room, you know, at seven o'clock at night and having people come in through the back door to tell us their experiences. Injustice is real. And, you know, I have the good fortune of, for a lot of reasons, having an education and a relatively cushy life, but the vast majority of people that I deal with don't. And so when you think about that role of a citizen scientist, when you think about the role of an advocate, you know, I think about it in terms of saving someone's life. Because once the community people 
in Texas, those farm workers got the information when they were able to say. I mean, I'm talking basic things like toilets in the field, being able to wash your hands, uh, actually having someone enforce the drip requirements, which basically means you can't spray people with pesticides. You cannot spray people with pesticides. And I, you know, remember the discussion about 24D and 245T? And DDT. The law is that you can't sell it anymore. Now, here's what most of the farmers did they bought up as much as they could. So, it's still out there, it's still in use. And so, the son or the daughter may be actually using the product now in their applications uh, versus the father who's now since gone, likely because of exposure to those very chemicals. But I would tell you that those applicators were lied to. I, I talked to many, I talked to many a farmer, many an applicator, told, just like the women in the beauty salons in Roxbury, Dorchester, and Manhattan, that those products were not harmful, they were lied to. They were lying to. The salespeople would come in and say, that 24D is good. This is not a problem with 24D. No arsenic, they never hurt anybody. It's a good product. It's not hugely expensive. We can do what we need to do. And, and killing people. So, well. That, that, I said killing people with my non EPA hat on. <laughs> with my EPA hat on, I'll say clearly I observed some health impacts that would not have otherwise occurred had they not been repeatedly exposed to pesticides. So, when you decide to become a citizen scientist, why are you doing it? What is it you hope to get out of? You've got to have an elevator speech. You know, there's a problem out there you want to solve. Get your people together. And when you get your scientists, don't get people you like. Get the smartest people you can find. And they'll bring other smart people with them. And that's what you're going to need. And I'll tell you, as a regulator, you know, we're, we're kind of slow. <coughs> we're really slow. I mean, when I, keep, when I hear you talking about EPA and, and updating uh, the Toxic Substances Control Act, you know, 65,000 chemicals, and does anybody here, can anybody name 20 nanoparticles? <laughs> well, what would you do if I told you you had nanoparticles probably in every piece of clothing on your body, and everything that you picked up? But I will tell you that when NGOs started saying, how are we going to regulate nanos, the federal government's position was, and I'll never forget this because I was just like sick, it was like, you know, basically that train's left the station, there's nothing you can do. So, we're talking about 65,000 chemicals here, and we could easily have, in the next five or ten years, another 100,000 chemicals, and we don't know anything about it. And that's everything. You name it, if you eat it, breathe it, wear it, you're going to be exposed to it. And, and so the, the idea of that, that, that citizen scientist becomes all the more important. But I did want to talk a little about some laws. And I, I started out by looking at uh, the FDA. I, e, e, EPA is in great shape in comparison to FDA. <laughs> 
All right, I'm going to talk for seven more minutes because you don't put a muzzle on me, I can keep going. So my first experience with the Food and Drug Administration, I had what appeared to be a straight, a not so straightforward pesticide case. It was a product that was being imported into this country that clearly had multiple uses. I thought that it was more appropriately an FDA issue than an EPA issue. I call up the Food and Drug Administration and they kind of blow me off. So I'm not one to be blown off. <laughs> so I'm like, do my little Google search, and I find out who the director of enforcement is for the Food and Drug Administration. And he explains to me, oh, we don't go after people like that, little lady. If you want to get them, you don't have to do it yourself. If EPA finds a product that it believes to be dangerous, we can issue a stop sale. Stop it. Food and Drug Administration can't. And that, that was my introduction. EPA will do an inspection based on a neutral inspection scheme because we can't. FDA can do an inspection but theirs are generally precipitated by having some information that will drive them to want to do it. I mean, even in terms of false and misleading language, at, at EPA, if you're talking about a pesticide or a, 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 a product, you know, I've gone after people that were selling a Coyote urine. Because people make claims. If, if you happen to be in rural Maine and you believe that that coyote urine has the benefit of keeping mosquitoes off, off of you or your animal, you will use it. Suppose you take that down to Florida. Suppose you take that down to Cuba. Suppose you take that to Puerto Rico. Suppose you end up with dengue fever and you're sitting there saying, I applied that product the way it said on the label. So as a regulator, when I see something that in some senses appears to be almost comical, that's a, that's a potential health impact. And at EPA, I believe that we take it far more seriously than the Congress has allowed the Food and Drug Administration. So, but again, We've identified 65,000 chemicals, and I easily think that by the end of this decade, we're probably talking about 200,000 chemicals, and we will not have identified them. And I think it's purely a function of our scientists not keeping up. You know, our not participating, and, and not being pushed, really. They're not being pushed hard enough by enough different groups. So when I, when I look at the Food and Drug Administration, you know, it's like, if you got to do something, they'll come after you, maybe. But it's got to be proven. And I just want to run through some of the things that, that they don't do. They don't do recalls. FDA doesn't require companies to share their safety data. I mean, you know, that's kind of shocking to me. FDA can, can only take a regulatory action if they have some reliable information believing that a cosmetic is adulterated or misbranded. Well, that implies that you're going to be going out there or, you, or you've got a credible tip. And the only company that I've ever, over the years, received credible tips from is 3M. Now, if you can get them involved in this in some way, they, they will rat out their competitors like no other. <laughs> you know, FDA, there's, there's no pre-market approval for cosmetics. The research is spotty at best. Their lab, they, they even admit it's almost non-existent. 
But what they will do is encourage you to participate in voluntary programs. That's, that's sort of their answer. And as a person who has, you know, seen some voluntary programs, they're, they're really hitting this. But, you know, that may be better than not. Now, there are other agencies that I'd like to bring up. Believe it or not, the Coast Guard. Okay, that's those people really trying to sneak products in under the radar. They get caught. Uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Now, uh, Pipeline and Hazardous Materials and Safety Administration. And EPA, I, I mentioned the Toxic Substances Control Act. I, I, I mentioned the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Odenticide Act, which I refer to as CIPRA. Uh, one of the only, I, I, would, I argue, the only multimedia statute that we have at EPA, potentially in the federal government, is called the Emergency Plan and Community Right to Know Act. And that is one of those tools that you can get that information. And the way you use it is you go to your local fire department. If you, if you see somebody with a manufacturing facility, try it. And if they don't do it, go to the state, because there's a state analog as well. And I've seen it work. Now, I don't know how well it's going to work in Binghamton, New York, or might not North Dakota, but it'll work in Brockton, Massachusetts. It'll work in Waterbury, Connecticut. It'll work in Bridgeport, Connecticut. So it works in some of the, some off the beaten path places, but it's a good way to get a handle on some of those basic chemicals that are being used in the production of products. OSHA. OSHA was the underbelly for getting at some of these cosmetic cosmetics issues, the personal care products issues. But the only way OSHA gets involved is that they have a tip. I could call OSHA up, and it's not a priority to me. This is what they told me. This is what their materials say. They rely almost exclusively on tips. And so, if a person is not willing to tip, and, and most of these operations are batch operations which means that they're relatively small. So if a person rats somebody out, this, they may fire everybody. They may fire everybody. Call me on their son-in-law, daughter-in-law, and say, well, we can keep the operations going for a few more weeks until we get some new people to come in, and we'll start over again. And it's going to take OSHA probably a year or two by the time it's all said and done. But, but OSHA has been that effective tool as sort of the backup, I would argue, to the Food and Drug Administration, Food and Drug Administration's inability to act. Some states have programs, and we heard a little bit about that. But I think that's correct. Uh, some municipalities have tried to come up with some ordinances, but again, that's going to be driven by what the states allow them to come up with. We don't like copying the European Union. Uh, but they tend to be willing to actually think about ways to protect their people. And so when you, when you contemplate your citizen science, and as an EPA person, when I would ask my staff to, to do some research on something, I would always say, what's the European Union doing? Well, what's Canada doing? Let's, let's have a point of comparison here. And, and maybe what we couldn't do is, is argue that our particular federal law required us to do something, but here's what we could do. We could say, depending on the size of that company, and I was honored enough, I'd actually figure out whether the heck they were doing business or had a staff person and say, well, you're doing business in this country. You're doing it there. Why aren't you doing it here? You, you'd be surprised. 
the number of times that you, you get people's attention when you do that. And, and, that, and that may be really our solution, and I'll tell you why. You know, there's some legislation to update the Food and Drug Administration Act out there now. Uh, proposed back in April by uh, Feinstein and Thomas. And it was legislation proposed in 2012. The 2012 legislation went nowhere. And there were like five sponsors for this new round. I will point out that no one from the Massachusetts, uh, neither one of our senators signed on. So, hint, hint. It's, it's a small pool, so that's telling me they don't see it as a problem. But this is something that goes, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, but we're talking about products that go through every person's hand probably 20 times a day. And you, could, you can't get 10 people to sign on to a bill? That's where we are. So, we all need to be better at this. We need to get mad. We need to feel like that this is part of a mission. If not for you, for your children, for your neighbor's children. Because this is going to kill someone. And you can look to the left, you can look to the right, and that's a good chance that somewhere along that road, somebody will pay the ultimate price. So, if you have a problem, be clear about what that problem is. Make no mistake that there are power dynamics in play that you are going to have to negotiate. Make that problem statement simple. Create an elevator speech. It, it can be two sentences, no more than three sentences. But tell people what that problem is, hit it, and move on. Devise a systems approach to solving your problem. You know, we've got NGOs represented here. We should have folks from the city. We've got women's groups, EJ groups. I think there was somebody here from the state. Acad academia, health advocacy groups, health clinic representatives, hospitals. You know, it's, it's like... And all the media? Is anybody here from the media? Is, that's, that's an ally that has to be at the table. So while setting these reasonable expectations to get where you need to go, you gotta, I would also contend that you've got to get the boards of directors. You can shame or you can push for disinvestment. The nuns are notorious for putting a hurt on companies. Civil suits, they're expensive, but they get people's attention. Uh, push some agencies to take criminal actions against some of these companies. Uh, force federal agencies to get, engage in more studies. Don't let them tell you it's too expensive or, you know, it's too abstract. You know, that, that worked 30 years ago, but we're still hearing the same, you know, excuses about the abstractions of some of these problems. And, you know, EPA can't figure out cumulative risk. Well, is it the cumulative risk is too difficult to figure out? Or have we, have we as an agency made a decision that we don't want to figure out cumulative risk? And finally, I, I would uh, suggest that, you know, to, to just remain positive. And that's probably one of the toughest things in the world. Just, you know, it's a battle that, that needs to be fought and won. So thank you. Thank you for your time. And we now would like to open up discussion directed to the panelists. But um, if any of you would like to start with a question or a comment that you uh, didn't have time to make before, um, I just wanted to offer you that opportunity to begin with. Otherwise, the floor is open and you can raise your hand and I'll run towards you with a mic. Or walk. <laughs> <laughs> um, and 
in hearing the three of you speak, which all of there's lovely sort of intertwining between your um, your talks and your thoughts, um, I was wondering if each one of you maybe could suggest um, a book that is something that is in your field that you read or that you recommend to lay audiences. The one that I was recently reading but I had to keep putting down because it made me so curious was Poison Spring which is actually by a former employee of the EPA talking about how hard it is from within the EPA to um, induce change there in terms of chemical regulations, stories of whistleblowers. It's really compelling and also frustrating. So I wondered, but don't answer too fast because I have to write it down. I would be glad to answer that question many times over, but my first answer would be a fun book called Breasts. The Natural and Unnatural History by Florence Williams. You know the book that came to mind for me was The Grapes of Wrath. Grapes of Wrath. By Steinbeck. Yeah. Winona LaDuke wrote a book in the mid-90s called All Our Relations or All My Relations that mm. talks about you know situations like Akwazesne but in a number of indigenous communities and focuses kind of on an activist in each of those communities because it's easy to get really down sometimes when talking about these kind of things and so I think it's important to, to highlight the hard work that people are doing in these places. Thank you for those resources. Any other questions? Yes. Hi, I'm Nikki, and um, I want to thank you for today and for all the work that you do. Um, I have a couple questions. One is, so the hormones, our hormones are being affected adversely from the chemicals, and I'm wondering if you can explain exactly what the chemicals do to our bodies. What do you think is happening to our bodies when the chemicals get inside us? And what do you know? I think you recommended fresh food and fiber to help rid us of the chemicals and to stay away from the chemicals, but uh, are there other things that you recommend or are there specific things regarding food that you recommend, you know, the, that women working in the hair salon, you know, might want to do to armor ourselves against the chemicals? And one more question. Um, does anybody have an opinion about pharmaceutical drugs? Okay. So a lot of the chemicals that we're interested in act by interacting with the estrogen receptors in our body. There are actually estrogen receptors in many, many organs in the body. And um, Laura can step up to the mic and explain this in more detail than I can. But uh, so our natural estrogen can turn them on and so can the synthetic chemicals. And that sets off a, a chain of signals throughout our body. That's one example. There are many different ways in which these chemicals can activate biological processes. And, and that's one of the things that we're trying to sort out, is what are all the pathways uh, of effects between chemicals and some disease. At Silent Spring Institute, we're also very interested in chemicals that are, are mammary gland carcinogens, breast carcinogens. So these would be chemicals that act on the body by damaging DNA. And uh, so they're, they're mutagens. And uh, they're also very common, they're in air pollution. For example, in, in perfluorinated, some of the perfluorinated compounds, the non-stick or stain-resistant surfaces. Um, I'm going to answer some of your, I'm going to turn to what can you do, and then I'm going to turn it over to Laura to say whatever additional she would like to say about the biology. So um, there are many decisions that we make every day that influence how much of these chemicals we're exposed to. And a good, a good easy place to start is to switch to uh, products that are fragrance free. Uh, and look for products that are plant based. And if you're in a workplace like a salon, make sure it's ventilated. And then I think at the next level, we do need to become engaged uh, in trying to make better rules. And we, this does work. 
Uh, we, we saw with the flame retardant standards that if you if you become engaged and bring bring your evidence with you and bring all your friends and uh, a large activist community, you can create change at the systems level. The federal government is pretty paralyzed right now in terms of reforming the Toxic Substances Control Act. I think that we don't really have the grassroots organization right now that could could change that. I, I, well, I should back up. Something is going to change in the federal regulations of toxic chemicals. We're not going to get everything we want right now, probably, but I do think that there will be some change for the good and that, and that the more we're talking to our elected officials, the more chance we have to make it better. Um, and there may be somebody else here who wants to add what's the best avenue for addressing that right now. Uh, Safer Chemicals Healthy Families has been my favorite avenue for action on the federal uh, toxics reform. I, I mean, so there are many, many different opportunities. The uh, Silent Spring website has a section called Too Close to Home. It gives a lot of examples of things that people can do. I just want to call your attention to time, and I want to be respectful for people who need to leave um, at the appointed time, but I wanted to give you at least a minute to respond. Under chronology in 60 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> so we often talk about hormones as locks and keys, right? So the receptor is this lock that's sitting there, and the hormone comes in and turns the key. And that tells cells something. So for example, it could tell cells, start making this protein in response. So in the uterus, it's like, build those cells to prepare for a potential baby. In other parts of our body, it's things like, here's a stem cell, it has a receptor, if it gets bound, it tells it become a bone or become a fat cell. And so some of the chemicals we're exposing people to are telling those stem cells, become fat cells, which means you end up with more fat cells and you don't have the right number of bone cells. So hormones aren't just telling your body, respond in this particular way, turn your genes on. They're also saying to cells, do this instead of that. So it's a, I mean, endocrinology is like a semester long course. That's like your, that's your 60 second lesson in how hormones act, but it's quite complicated because it can both be things like, how do you tell a cell to do something? You change what genes it turns on or off. But also it could be, what is this cell? Our eyeball cells are different than our muscle cells are different than our toenail cells. And hormones are responsible for some of those decisions that are made. Thank you so much. I'm sorry that we don't have any more time for more questions. Um, I just want to thank again, panel members. Please give them a round of applause. Thank you.